Well, good morning, everyone, or maybe good afternoon or evening, depending where you're joining us from. And welcome to the Launchpad and our live conference of NASA's update on the Artemis 1 wet dress rehearsal and launch plans. Engineers have successfully completed work on items identified during the previous wet dress rehearsal tests, including replacing and testing an upper stage check valve and fixing a small leak within the tail service mass umbilical ground plate. Teams also completed some tasks originally scheduled to take place in the VAB after the wet dress rehearsal was completed. Through the Artemis missions, NASA plans to land the first woman uh, and the first person of color back on the moon this decade, and NASA is expected to give an update here to media and to us uh, on the process and the progress they have made uh, on towards the final tests needed before launch and what NASA was going to do, uh, including proving the operations to load propellant into the rocket's tank to be able to conduct a full launch countdown and to demonstrate the ability to recycle the countdown clock and then drain tanks to give them an opportunity to practice the timelines and procedures they would use on an actual launch day. So we're hoping to hear some more about that. Today's uh, press teleconference will include uh, Tom, the Deputy Associate Administrator for the Common Exploration System, Cliff, the Senior Vehicle Operations Manager, and John, the Chief Engineer of the Space Launch System Program. Uh, this is a teleconference, so there won't be any live video of it, but we will be listening in and providing updates in the chat. If you haven't yet, follow us over on Twitter. We'll be live tweeting updates as well. We're expecting this teleconference to get underway in just a couple of minutes, so stay with us right here on the Launchpad to listen in on NASA's update on the Artemis 1 wet dress rehearsal and launch. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Catherine Hamilton with NASA's Office of Communications. Team NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida continue to prepare the Space Launch System rocket and the Ryan spacecraft to return to Launch Pad 39B to complete wet dress rehearsal activities ahead of the uncrewed Artemis 1 lunar mission. The rehearsal is the final task needed before launch and calls for NASA to practice the timelines and procedures to load cryogenic or I'm Catherine Hamilton with NASA's Office of Communications. Teams at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida continue to prepare. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Catherine Hamilton with NASA's Office of Communications. Teams at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida continue to prepare the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft to return to Launch Pad 39B to complete the wet dress rehearsal activities ahead of the uncrewed Artemis 1 lunar mission. The rehearsal is the final test needed before launch and calls for NASA to practice the timelines and procedures to load cryogenic or super cold propellants into the rocket's tanks conduct a full launch countdown, and also drain the tanks. Here to talk with us about the recent work in the Vehicle Assembly Building and the path to get back to the pad are Tom Whitmire, Deputy Associate Administrator for Common Exploration Systems Development at NASA Headquarters, Cliff Lanham, Senior Vehicle Operations Manager for Exploration Ground Systems Program at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and John Blevins, Chief Engineer for the Space Launch System Program at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. 
We'll start with opening comments from Tom Whitmire and Cliff Lanham, and then Tom, Cliff, and John will take your questions. You can answer star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. Again, your phones are on mute now, and the operator will open your mic when we're ready and close your mic after you ask your question. Shortly after we conclude, you'll listen, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. First, we'll hear from Tom Whitmire. Tom? Uh, thank you, Catherine. First of all, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. I know it's uh, getting ready for the Memorial Day weekend, and we appreciate your uh, dialing in, and hopefully we'll be able to give you a good update today. I'll, I'll talk a little bit up front. Uh, Cliff will get uh, through most of the detailed uh, specifics in terms of the role and what, what was accomplished in the VAB. Of course, Dr. Blevins is here to ask her any specific technical questions you might have. And then in a, when we get to the role, we'll have another get-together, and this time we'll, we'll get Charlie up here and she'll talk to the actual specific uh, exercise that we'll, we'll go through as we go through wet dress rehearsal. So if you have really detailed questions in that area, Charlie will be available in, in a, a couple weeks and she can answer your questions then. Um, let me just add, you know, Jim had a chance to come uh, update you last time, and I just want to reinforce some of the things Jim said in terms of this is a, a very, uh, you know, com a complicated process, so we have a very robust uh, vehicle, a, a great design, uh, but the actual, uh, and the, the, the vehicle itself is a very um, straightforward vehicle. But anytime you get into a loading operations with cryogenics, it's something that you have to kind of take a step at a time and learn through uh, the process, how the uh, hardware is behaving, as well as the rocket. The, the, the rocket itself is doing very good. Well, all the things that we've seen so far have been very positive in terms of the actual performance of the hardware, and but we are still working through some of our, our processing. And I think Jim mentioned it last time, we'll actually add a little schedule this time around just to make sure if we have to do more than one wet dress rehearsal attempt we're, we're, that we're ready to, to support that. And so I'm going to let Cliff get into the specifics. He'll talk about the check valve. We'll talk about the umbilical work that we've done. Uh, we've got some GN2, um, robust GN2 system now that's really been upgraded, and we're very um, happy for that. And then uh, also uh, uh, Dr. Blevins is here in case you have any specific questions. With that, Cliff, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom, and hello, everyone. Um, let's see, since we last spoke, teams have been hard at work preparing the Space Launch System rocket and the Orion spacecraft to return back to uh, Pad 39B. We're planning for that to occur on June 6th in preparation for our next wet dress rehearsal. Uh, teams have performed several leak checks to address the liquid hydrogen leak that was found on the tail service mass umbilical between the mobile launcher and the rocket during the previous wet dress rehearsal attempt. As we mentioned in our previous teleconference, uh, we noticed the flange bolts on the tail service mass umbilical had loosened over time. So we went in there and uh, retightened the bolts on the flanges and uh, conducted several leak tests and uh, observed the, the system and uh, ensured they did not loosen, uh, loosen back up. And uh, all looks good there. Um, after replacing, uh, so we'll move on here. After replacing the helium check valve and other hardware located on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, we tested it to ensure it functioned properly. And so far, we've had no issues with the new hardware. We have also modified the uh, ICPS, uh, again, the second stage umbilical boots, uh, which is the area enclosing the umbilical uh, quick disconnect uh, between the umbilical arm and the vehicle. And we we're adding additional uh, leak detectors on the uh, liquid hydrogen side um, of that uh, in order to gain some visibility into any potential leaks um, that would occur during tanking operations. This modification also allowed us to complete some of the forward work that we had originally uh, scheduled to take place in the VAB after a wet dress rehearsal. Uh, so some of the work we've completed in that uh, area for the Orion crew module, we opened up the uh, hatch and we installed um, part of some of the payloads. Um, the BioX-1 uh, space biology experiment, we got the uh, containers that will actually hold the experiment installed. Um, we've also um, worked on several uh, external areas of the um, uh, crew or the Orion uh, in terms of um, we put on the uh, plates that uh, the last plates um, that where instrumentation was running through um, for the rollout, we took those off the uh, GSE plates, the ground system um, plates, and we went ahead and put the flight plates on. Uh, and that'll give us additional protection when we roll out uh, from the weather and the environment. 
And then we also removed uh, much of the instrumentation that was on for the dynamic rollout test, as well as we've been working on uh, core stage TPS. Uh, we did some leak checks on the uh, pneumatic actuation separation system for ICPS, and we uh, changed out some instrumentation inside the uh, boosters. So meanwhile, while the, our team has been working inside the VAB out at the launch pad, um, we also tested the new upgrades to the gaseous nitrogen supplier that supplies us nitrogen uh, during the propellant loading. Overall, the testing was successful, and we should be in good shape for wet dress and are currently targeting um, call to stations on the evening of June 5th. Um, actually, uh, let me back up here. So that test went well. And now I'll talk more specifically to the dates here. Um, so right now, again, we are looking at call to stations for the rollout to the pad on June the 5th. Uh, call to stations is expected to be around 6 p.m. Uh, with first motion around midnight on June the 6th. Um, we were going later in the evening uh, because with uh, the weather in Florida in the June timeframe, um, it's much less likely to have thunderstorms in that time. Um, what this does, this will put our WDR flow, cryo flow, no earlier than the 19th of June. Uh, we have built in two weather uh, days that could move that date um, around slightly. Um, again, it is Florida in June, so uh, thunderstorms are expected. Um, and we'll, we'll, we will also be working uh, any range constraints that may come up. Um, so, again, looking at uh, no earlier than uh, cryo flow of uh, June the 19th. Also, um, we are wrapping up the work. Um, we are finishing up a, a few items in there, um, but we do expect to start retracting the platforms next week in anticipation of a uh, rollout to the pad. And uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. All right, so now we'll begin the question and answer portion. Again, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the queue at any time, and you can enter star two if you'd like to be removed from the queue. We ask that you please stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. All right, so first we will go to Marsha Dunn of AP. Oh, yes, hi. Um, probably for Cliff, although I'm not sure. Um, you mentioned in case you have to do more than one more wet dress. Uh, what would what kind of things would happen in the um, June 19th or whenever fueling test that would prompt you to want to redo it? Um, assuming you've got all these latest problems fixed, what else could require a second wet dress? Thanks. Marsha, this is Tom. Let me start with and then I'll let um, I'll let Cliff follow up on that. And, and, and when next time up, we'll have Charlie here, and she'll, she'll be even more articulate than either Cliff and I could be. But uh, what we're really, one of the things we're really trying to do is we want to show the dual cryo load. So we want to load the core stage, and then we want to load the upper stage and verify all the new procedures are working the way we think they should work. And then we want to get down into the count, and we're specifically looking at a GLS, ground launch sequencer, to ALS transition point. And so we'd really like to get to that transition and show that we're able to handle off from the ground to the vehicle where it takes control. And so that would be the thing if for whatever reason we're not able to get to that point in the countdown that we would want to take another look to see if it made sense to do another attempt or not. And it's, it's very situationally dependent. It depends on how much of the activities we can get through. But we really would like to, to demonstrate the dual cryo loading and we would like to try to get down on the count. And Cliff, can you get, is there anything you'd like to add to that? or? I think you covered it, Tom. Um, again, you know, getting uh, cryos up into the second stage as well um, will be important, and um, we're looking forward to getting that done. But I think you covered it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Yeah, hey, thanks, guys. Um, this may be for, for Dr. Blevins. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the confidence level you have in fixing the LH2 leak. I mean, I'm I'm asking that because we were going back today thinking about, you know, trouble with the sh the shuttles, you know, ground umbilical plate back in 2009, where you had two flows out of three that got, you know, sidelined by cryo leaks that you really couldn't confirm until you flowed cryo. Is it the same case here, or is there something that makes you think you really have fixed it this time? Thanks. Hey, Bill. That's uh, that's a really good question. Uh, first of all, you are correct to say that. 
you cannot confirm the leak until you do flow cryos, right? That's a different condition. We don't do that in the VAB. But let me tell you why we do have confidence, and I think there's good confidence among the ground team as well as I have confidence in what they've done. Uh, these seals that they use, and, and you heard Cliff mention the seals and, and uh, tightening it down, he talked about rechecking those seals. Those seals age with time, and so what had, what had happened is we had tightened those down um, previously and, and uh, we hadn't done really a series of torque checks over the period of time that we found now that those seals age. I think that's really a good way to put it as we age those seals to prevent leakage. And so we have good confidence that we've done the right process. And you're correct to say that uh, we'll have to verify that when we get out to the pad and flow the cryos. Now, there is one good mitigating circumstance uh, in the event that it's not a 100% solution, and that is we can access those at the pad. So uh, any additional mitigation can be performed at the pad. But I do have good confidence that we've got the right process. Uh, will it have to be tweaked? That's, that's a possibility, and we'll find out pretty shortly. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeff Faust of Space News. Hey, good afternoon. Question probably for Cliff. I'm curious with the uh, get-ahead work that you were able to do while you were back in the VAB, how much uh, time in terms of the schedule that saves you? And also, are you able to do anything with the uh, in terms of servicing those uh, CubeSat secondary payloads? Um, if they need, for example, their batteries topped off or anything like that? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so, um, from the work standpoint, um, well, let me let me talk to CubeSat real quick. Um, the uh, we do have the capability to recharge um, several of the um, small CubeSats, and um, you know we have done that previously. So um, that is uh, complete. And then uh, for the uh, um, previous question, we have um, in terms of the work. And the schedule that we've completed outside of the, uh, the known issues that we came back to fix, um, we have done a lot of work that is primarily, um, it, it'll really help us from a um, standpoint of um, the volume of work. That's the best way I can put it. Um, it's not necessarily critical path work that we uh, were able to perform, but we were able to get um, a significant amount of other work, I'll call it, and we did run into some non-conformances with that work that would have uh, cost us time later. So that that's very beneficial um, for when we come back. And then from a also from a um, resource standpoint, it allows us to uh, lessen the demand on our resources when we do get back into VAB, and um, and what I feel is lessen the risk on our overall schedule um, for rolling back out for launch. Thank you. Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Hi, uh, thanks for doing this, and I hope you all have a great Memorial Day weekend as well. Um, I think this is a question for Tom. Um, can you talk about any concerns that you're tracking with the hardware, you know, as this launch slips further into summer or fall or beyond? I know you've been monitoring the boosters, and I think you're pretty confident in, in the lifetime of those, but but maybe other systems as well. I guess it, what I'm wondering is, is there a date when you need to launch by before you might have to start thinking pretty seriously about destacking components of the rocket? Thank you. Hey, Eric, that's a great question. Uh, for, first of all, right now, we, everything we've looked at is, uh, in the foreseeable future, we're not tracking any limited life items that would cause us a concern. And I'll ask Dr. Blevins to add to this so I'll give you a good answer. The, um, you know, as we proceed into the year, depending on what we've seen, um, what we typically would do, the process that we normally follow, and we did this uh, throughout the shuttle program, is if we identify something that's beginning to get close to one of our limited life areas, and that would be in the late fall time frame, uh, we evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis, and each of the items have specific approaches that we look at, we, you know, with the boosters we have, testing that we've done to see if the propellant's sagging, if we have any concerns there. There's a little strap that holds the uh, the arrays on Orion, and we would take another look at that to make sure that the Kevlar strap um, is qualified for a longer period of time. So, you know, I don't really see foresee anything uh, that we would, uh, we would have a concern with or, you know, the stop the clock thing. And what we would normally do is just follow our typical procedure, which is 
if we do extend into that period of time, we would definitely, you know, keep checking. We have a very accurate list. We keep track of all the environments that the hardware is seeing, and then we would um, evaluate it. And, and, and most times it's just a matter of sharpening your pencil. You don't want to do all that up front if you don't think you need it. As you get closer and, and later into the year, we would go back and do that. And, uh, John, do you have anything to add to that? Is a, a, well, well, Tom, I think uh, you covered most of it really well there. We do track all of the uh, limited life items, Eric. Uh, you know, the, the soft goods are really the major concern as you go through that. Uh, I know you mentioned booster stack life. Uh, uh, that's also a concern. But, you know, all of it's data-driven. That's really what we do. Right now what we do is we track those to a margin. So usually we have multiple lives that we're tracking to, and so we know when we eat into that. Uh, you do bring up a really good point that sometimes uh, as we try to perfect one system, you can add risk to another uh, by trying to make one perfect and add, uh, you know, stack life or other age life. So we track not just the, uh, the life-limited calendar time, uh, Eric, but we also track the usage, right? So how many cycles we put on. Uh, the tanks or any other thing. And so we're tracking all that well. And as Tom said, there's nothing really in the foreseeable future with our anticipated usage or calendar time that prevents, uh, you know, um, or, or merits any immediate attention over the next uh, several months beyond our intended thought date. Thank you. Our next question is from Philip Sloss of NASA Space Flight. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if this is for Dr. Blevins or, or Cliff or maybe even Mr. Whitmire. Um, I wanted to just get a little bit of um, detail about you were looking into a root cause for the uh, rubber quick disconnect seal failing and also any root cause for the, the, the aft purge boot uh, leak um, and, and what you're doing uh, going forward on those. Thanks. John, why don't you start? I think that uh, this would be a good one for you to start on. Yeah, I think so too, Tom. I've, I've been involved in some of this. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, Phillips referring to two different systems. You know, when he said the the rubber seal, I think he's talking about the uh, the uh, specifically talking about the butane seal on the ground side QD on the helium field system. There's two systems that we're looking at, and and Cliff mentioned them as we started up. And one of them is the helium field system. That's the one we'll talk about with a uh, check valve uh, and uh, and, and, and we talked about that check valve last time. So let me let me just cover a few things there because I know there's been a lot of talk. One is the check valve was just fine. We, we did ingest a small piece of debris that held the check valve open. That's why it didn't pass the reverse flow check. And so that check valve actually was then tested uh, to our acceptance criteria and it passed that acceptance criteria. It was sacrificed, uh, you know, to um, uh, essentially investigation, destructive evaluation just to take a look at it. Uh, to add to our database, but uh, ultimately there was no problem with the check valve. We did have an issue there on that quick disconnect. We had a rubber seal, if you will, that had been dislodged. Uh, we do have a fault tree. We're working through that fault tree. There are several suspect um, uh, items. Uh, all of those are under mitigation, if you will, or will be under mitigation. Uh, you know, we want to look really hard at that and not jump to conclusions. So on that particular one with the helium fill system, uh, I feel very confident uh, in the system we have today because we uh, we x-rayed it. We did uh, stacked x-rays or CT scans to take a look that it's in the design configuration, and it indeed is. Uh, when you mentioned the boot, and we have worked on the boot, and I'm glad that somebody brought that up because I think there's some misunderstanding on the boot. Uh, what we saw was we saw a little bit of air being sucked into the HAZGAS system uh, from that boot. That boot is just a push fit, uh, so kind of a, a pressure seal there. Uh, and, and, of course, this is a case where we've talked before, there's a difference between ambient checking and cryogenic checking. And so we check to see if that boot sucks in any air, if it leaks helium out as we purge that with warm helium over those QDs around that boot to prevent icing, uh, as well as other uh, situations. And particularly for the hydrogen, we, we prevent a flammability situation. And so uh, what we're doing there is we don't want a false measure of flammability. Uh, any contaminant, even if it's air, uh, it, it shows up in our has gas uh, system as potential hydrogen, and we've got a 4% limit on that. And, of course, if you're putting helium in and you suck air into that boot, you know, helium and air don't burn, and so we don't want a false alarm. And so what we're doing there is we're adding some measurements. We will take that to a mass spec for the ground side. Uh, very innovative by our EGS uh, team to do that and move it over to 
some aspect that they can use and then differentiate between uh, that air and hydrogen so that we don't falsely shut down the tanking of the system due to a false alarm. I think that kind of answers uh, the question um, that, uh, that Philip was asking there, Tom, but uh, you can certainly add more. You've been part of this discussion as well. Yeah, yeah. We, we were actually just talking this earlier today, and uh, we're going through a board, and we think we're ready to go uh, to wet dress, and we've cleared it for that. We'll take and finish up um, the root cause for the check valve. And the check valve, to John's point, just uh, performed great. We just had a, a little piece of rubber, and, and we're going to need to make sure. And right now the system's clean. Everything's ready to go. I did think of when Bill brought up the thing earlier about the guppa leaks, and we were all there. I was on the shuttle program for that. And one of the things that we are doing for the boot is actually putting an external monitor out, and that's kind of a similar thing that we did back in 2009. So uh, I think that will really help. You know, we think we're getting good purge in that area. We think that we're just getting false trips, but we'll having an extra set of data to take a look at will help us verify um, that that's the condition that we're looking at. And, uh, boy, I really wish I had a picture of this thing to show you. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. We actually were visiting Florida the other day, and we, they took us over and showed us the QD, showed us the boot, showed us how it all comes together, and it really makes a lot more sense when you can kind of see it. But I think I think I agree with Dr. Blevins, and, and Cliff, I think, would say the same thing, that uh, we think they've done a good job taking a look at it. They've put some mitigations in place and some additional monitoring in place, and hopefully uh, that, that will address the condition we saw during the last test. And Cliff, do you have anything else to that? But that's, that's kind of how I'd summarize it. Uh, yeah, Tom, only thing I would add is um, we're in process of putting those fixes in place uh, right now, and um, we anticipate that being, uh, you know, fully ready to go um, well ahead of our rollout. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Young of Space Flight Now. Hi, yes, I think um, this is a question for Dr. Blevins or perhaps Cliff. I wanted to get a better understanding of the sequence of events leading up to the hydrogen leak during the last WGR attempt. i um, hoping you can tell us how many times did you actually start the hydrogen fast fill? When was the hazardous gas detection triggered? What was the maximum concentration? Uh, and how far above the limits was that? And also, we got Twitter updates that described a surge of hydrogen during the transition to fast fill. It sounds like geysering, but I didn't think that was a thing with hydrogen, and I'm hoping you can also explain that. Well, I guess I can uh, – this is John Blevins. I guess I'll take the first stab, uh, Stephen, at, at uh, some of your – questions there. Uh, as far as uh, the sequence of events uh, that occurred for the hydrogen fill, and, and, and I was, you know, sitting there on console, it's been a little while, so you'll have to forgive any memory losses here. But, you know, we we had a, a constraint. We still have the constraint uh, for this initial full tanking uh, for the aft strut, and so we stopped the uh, oxygen tanking at, at roughly 49%. We have a 50% limit that we don't want to tank to just because of the load. We don't that, want that load on that aft strut until we start um, uh, contracting the, um, the hydrogen tank, if you will, due to its initial temperature. And, and so we did actually get some good data on that, by the way. And then so we had done the slow fill uh, and got to that point of fast fill, which is roughly that 5% um, full wet sensors. And immediately upon uh, the fast fill, we detected the hydrogen leak. So it wasn't uh, very far into that. I do not recall recycling to do it again, but I would have to look at my very specific notes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different responsibilities on launch day, and mine is mainly to monitor the vehicle and make sure it's performing well. I was sitting with the uh, ground um, system chief engineers, and, and we were all talking together. So I don't recall a second attempt, but Cliff or Tom uh, may be able to uh, correct me on uh, on that. But But as far as your question about when it was detected, um, you know, that was um, that was pretty much right away uh, during the fast fill time. Uh, as far as the, the geysering question, I'll, I'll skip to that comment. Uh, yeah, not really a thing for hydrogen. And, and uh, you know, as far as what you probably heard is that uh, uh, it was warm. Uh, you know, the hydrogen, uh, you know, it, due to buoyancy, will we'll accumulate hydrogen. And so when we change from slow fill to fast fill, what we had is we had some lines that were vertical lines, and, and since those vertical lines weren't bled per se, uh, when we started that, you suck in that warm amount of hydrogen 
Um, and so that's probably what you heard, but it's not the same as an oxygen line where you would have, say, warm propellant in a feed line that might traverse that feed line and cause a geysering issue. So it's it's certainly not the same, but that's probably what you heard. We have corrected uh, our loading ops to a point where we think that uh, both the oxygen and the hydrogen, as far as accumulation of warm propellant, is mitigated. So I'll, I'll, uh, I think that answered two of your three comments and questions, and I think Cliff may have the other one. No, John, we would have to get back. I was not on console that day, um, so I don't want to speak to the exact chain of events there. Yeah, I actually have a phone and friend here with me, our mission manager, Mike Serafin. Mike, how did you describe it? Yeah, so um, John John Blevins is absolutely right that when um, when we transitioned from the chill down and slow fill to fast fill, we did see an increase in pressure. Um, so it, it may have been initially called or characterized as a pressure spike when we went from the, from the slow to the fast fill. Um, when that happened, we did see a hydrogen leak and it did um, hit our concentration limit constraint, which is 4%. Within the um, within the confined space that we measure, uh, the team stopped the flow and uh, assessed the data, and then decided to to try again a second time. And when they tried again the second time, they essentially got the same result. They yeah. they saw the the pressure increase when they went to fast fill. We saw a leak as detected by the hazardous gas system. The hazardous gas system that hit our concentration limit, and that's at the point where we decided to knock it off. So they did They did try twice during the uh, final attempt, and um, that, that essentially confirmed that we had some work to do there on, yeah. that, on that umbilical. Yeah, Mike and I had a chance to visit Cliff a couple of weeks ago. We got a tour of the whole thing, and this is another one. It's kind of like the boot. If you could see it, it would be a lot easier to understand it. He, he did a fantastic job of showing us where the cryogenics come into the ML. We have what we call skids. Skids are a fancy term we use at NASA. They're pallets where we keep the valves that open and close that allow the cryo to flow, and there's two skids, one for the core stage, and then there's a second skid for the upper stage, and it's in a different location. Uh, and so it's a big Y, and it goes to two skids, and when we change the pump speed, it actually pulls up some of that uh, cryo that's been kind of warming up and pulls it into the system. And LOX is different than hydrogen. LOX is dense. It's like the density of water, so we pump it from a pump that's actually uh, at the pad, and we pump it through the system, and we worry about geysering, which we discussed before. Hydrogen wants to flow. It, it actually doesn't require a pump. It's a pressure um, a managed system, and uh, the thing you got to work out for hydrogen is you have to bleed it off and get that temperature down. So these folks have done a tremendous job of looking at the system, where the skids are located, what this pump speed regulation needs to be, how um, you know we worry about geysering with locks because we go up the down comers to get to the core stage. Uh, and also we worry about pressure with hydrogen. It'll heat up, and therefore we, we have worked uh, our way out of having high point bleed so that we can get the temperature down with the hydrogen. So I think that's and then that's all really complicated stuff. Once we get this dialed in, as they they say, we'll actually have a really successful loading operation. Sometimes you just have to learn these things as you go through the process because it's really cold, cold stuff that we're flowing, and it, it will change state on you pretty quickly if you're if you're not uh, moving it in the precise right fashion. So that's kind of how I would describe it. I think each one of us would probably describe it a little bit different. Cliff, you have any thoughts on that one? That's that's kind of my thought on on how to describe it. Yep, you hit it. You hit it, Tom. Right on. Yeah, I, I have the benefit of actually getting to join these folks and, and Dr. Blevins and Cliff and, and Charlie, and we go down and we'll, we will walk through the whole thing and look at the hardware and follow the lines and see where the cryo's flowing and look at the skids and stuff. So, uh, you know, I wish we could take you all along for one of those tours because it just makes this stuff a lot easier to understand. But, you know, I think they've got a pretty good plan in place. We'll see how it turns out as we get into our next attempt. But I certainly think we've learned a lot and uh, figured out a lot of specific things and how you want to do this dance and you know, checked off a lot of steps, but we really need to get back into the flow and the loading operations to see if we figured everything out. And if we don't, we'll, we'll have to spend another uh, opportunity to, to verify it. Dr. Blevins, anything else on that? That's kind of my... No, I think that's a great summary. And, and 
uh, I'm looking forward to getting back out there and trying it again. Yeah, I think for us, we really, really want it. We're really ex- you know, actually kind of a little bit of excited to have an opportunity to take this knowledge that we have now and give it a, you know, and, and, and put it into the system uh, with the updated procedures. Uh, many of them have been put into software, uh, and uh, and we're really generally very interested, in, and hopefully this will go well, but we also recognize we still could be missing something, so we'll find out uh, here shortly. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Mark Corot of Aviation Week. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just double check that the uh, the goal is to get down to eventually the uh, L minus 9.3 second point with a with a count to 33 seconds, and then a go back to I think three for a 10 minute hold. Is that still the how close you want to get to an actual launch? Yeah, this is Tom, and that's correct, Mark. And, and Charlie, will uh, we'll have Charlie back up here uh, for the next go around, and we'll we'll she'll walk you through all the the procedures and the and the uh, what the what the what the countdowns will look like, and also um, the, the rest of the activity. But that Mark, you got it right, and we will have Charlie here next time, and she'll go through a really detailed description for you guys once we get a little bit closer to the wet dress. Thank you very much. And Mark, we've got the countdown timeline uh, as well as the um, the differences between the launch countdown and the wet dress countdown. Those are online if you uh, need to reference those for those specific um, points uh, where it will stop on each run and recycle. Um, all right, our next question is from Josh Dinner of Space.com. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, this question is for Cliff. If everything goes well during the June wet dress rehearsal, is there a specific window, or I guess window hopeful perhaps, of one of the ones that have been outlined through this year and next? Uh, is there a specific one of those that's being targeted for the launch right now? I'll help Cliff off on that one, and then uh, and then he can add if I'm missing anything. You know, first of all, I think Jim was with you last time, and I know the administrator might have mentioned this as well. So we're looking at an August uh, window. Uh, is our opportunity. And all those windows have been put online and Catherine can point you in the right direction so you can go find uh, what the windows look like. Now, of course, we're always very nervous because as I mentioned, we've we've learned a lot so far. And so we really want to get into this cryo load and demonstrate everything, get down to the count, and then we'll we'll set an official date. But I think both the administrator and Jim have kind of identified as the August timeframe as the one that we're currently looking at. Um, But I just want to be really careful. I don't want to sound overly optimistic or mislead you, we really feel like we need to uh, get into this cryo load, do all the things we just described, which are kind of complicated, actually. It's a great vehicle, a very simple vehicle, but the actual procedure that you go through with any vehicle of this nature requires fine-tuning. Um, and so that's, that's I think, where we're at. Cliff, any additional thoughts to that? I think that's kind of... No, Tom, uh, again, you, you covered it. Um, I appreciate that. And, uh... You know, we'll take into account um, any of the work we just completed, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, in that post-WDR time frame, as well as any um, concerns or issues we have to deal with um, coming out of WDR. Um, but like you said, it, it's it's too early at this point for us to really forecast that beyond what you said, the August time frame. And uh, that those launch periods are linked on the media resources tab for the Artemis One mission on NASA.gov, uh, along with that um, countdown timeline that I mentioned as well. Our next question is from Jim McDade of 1819 News Huntsville. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, answering our questions. Uh, I think uh, in the beginning, Mr. Whitmire mentioned changing out the GSC plates with flight plates. I'd like to know a little more about that. Is that a procedure that was initially or normally scheduled to be done at the pad? And uh, what what went into the decision to go ahead and do that in the, in the VAB, if it was? Yeah, Jim, I'm trying to remember what I might have said. I might have misspoke. I don't. I haven't really changed any plates out. Uh, we we replaced the the, the, the check valve that uh, John and and Cliff talked to, and that would actually worked. It, the check valve was actually working okay. We just had a little piece of debris stuck in it. I'm trying to think, if there's anything else that I might have mentioned um, in terms of any off nominal stuff. I think pretty much everything that we're doing right now is uh, just the work that Cliff described. Um, um, so I'm hey, trying Tom. to talk with. Yeah, go ahead, Tom, Cliff. I might be able to help. This is Cliff. Um, so I mentioned, you know, with the last, we did take off uh, the ground plates. 
um, that where the instrumentation for dirt was rolling through. Um, so we did change those out to the flight plates and there was a um, oxidizer, oxidizer panel plate also that was put on for flight. So what we did, we took the opportunity to go ahead and put some flight plates on, um, particularly in the Orion area um, while we were in the VAB. Yeah, thank you for saving me. I forgot about that. Yes, that was a good question, Jim, and and that's why. So it was just kind of an opportunity to get ahead type of thing. Thank you. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Danielle Regretta from R Drone UI. Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all of you, for taking my, my question. This is for a really wide Spanish audience. Um, and this is uh, regarding uh, if you you can tell us more about the general state of other stage of the rocket and if anything else has been done a part of the initial problems uh, you just corrected. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, Daniel, can you just what was the second part of the question again? I just want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. If anything else has been done uh, a part of these initial problems. Yeah. Let me see. I'll, I'll, let me see if I can. At this time, let me see if I can help out, and then just um, repeat your question if I get something. First of all, and for the Spanish audience, I can't tell you how proud we are that we have an ESA service module as part of this flight. Anybody who's seen some of the pictures of the rollout and stuff will see the ESA logo on it. And I just want to make sure everybody from the Spanish audience knows how important we think our uh, partnership is, and how proud we are to have uh, the ESA capabilities on the vehicle. And uh, and and that's great. The other thing is, is, is I'm being reminded that we have a deep space network uh, facility in Madrid. And I'm I'm and, and, and Daniel, I assure you, I'm one of the people who would love to go visit it because I think Spain's a beautiful country, and I would love to be able to see that 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 dish. So that's a really important thing for us, particularly for this mission, because we're going into deep space. So I think everybody in Spain should be very proud of the fact that they're helping us communicate with our vehicle, and and when we have the crew fly the next flight, uh, they'll be talking um, to folks. Folks on the Earth coming through the Spanish uh, Spanish capability, so we're really excited about that. Well, I, all of us are really just um, really happy to have this partnership working together, having uh, you know all these other countries that are part of this mission. And I really hope that everybody in Spain, when they see uh, this flight and they watch it leave the pad and as it goes into deep space and kind of track it as it goes through, and Mike, my mission manager here, Mike Serafin, will be describing that as we get closer, that they feel that they're part of that mission and the things that they do are in space with us because that's how we feel about it and we're just really happy to have a partnership and like I said Daniel in fact I've always kind of argued I was talking to Tony that we had a Carlos and Tony are two folks that we have that kind of uh, work with us and uh, with the international coordination and uh, my goal is to have after the missions complete to go visit some of these countries and I think Spain would be the one I would like to visit the most so I hope did I answer your question I, I was hoping I got the answer question right uh, oh yes, I am. And um, uh, some of the question is about uh, the general state of other stages also of the rocket. If you make plans in, uh, to, to correct other things, not n not um, uh, explicit on, on the first with just rehearsal. You know, everything else was looking great. Even the check valve turned out to be a little piece of debris, the check valve. So I you know, always look for an opportunity to say is the Mega Moon rocket's doing really good. Uh, you know, we really are happy with uh, the performance of the vehicle and it's uh, the Orion and the service module. We do a lot. What, what we don't talk about is Cliff and his team are constantly powering the vehicle up, powering it down, checking things. And so we don't really report that progress because it's all going very well. And so we're not seeing anything unusual. The checkouts are going great. The vehicle is in good condition. Uh, you know, we've had a couple things that we've described, which I really view as more of a first-time kind of learning exercise on how to move, uh, you know, hydrogen and, and, and locks, which are really actually a, a tricky thing to do. But when you look at the performance of the vehicle itself, we're in all the stages of the vehicle, including the service module, uh, it's 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 gone very well. And so we, there really isn't anything else to report um, outside of the updates that were given. But I do I would point out that then. Can, can verify this. We spent a lot of time powering the vehicle up and powering it down, and uh, everything else is checking out very well. And I know, Cliff, if you had anything you want to add to that, or uh, only thing I would add, Tom, is um, yeah, you're absolutely right again uh, in terms of 
Uh, actually, we're powered. We just powered down today the ICPS as we're doing uh, confidence checks to make sure everything is in good shape uh, prior to rolling. Um, and we'll be doing that for the core stage and the boosters on Tuesday. Um, again, confidence checks now that we buttoned up uh, the vehicle um, in anticipation of rolling. Um, again, we're, we're constantly up and down with power. And again, we check everything, uh, make sure it's all functioning properly before we'll roll out. Thank you. Our next question is from Ken Kramer of Space Up Close. Oh, hi, thank you for doing this and telling us all these details. Um, I would like to ask you about the gaseous nitrogen upgrade. If you can go into that into some much greater detail about, you know, what you what you've done. I know you did it it's a test. Talk about that. And and why are you confident now that uh, that you have sufficient capability? Thank you. Hey, Ken, this is Sam. I'll I'll start a little bit on that, and, and then we'll also talk about the confidence test as well. Uh, a company actually provides a service to NASA. It's just off site. Uh, the uh, if you go down State Road three, if you're leaving the KSC side of the, and heading down State Road three, you'll see this uh, company. It's on the right hand side. It's called Air Liquide. And the, what they do, and I, I know more, more about gases, nitrogen now than I thought I ever would. Uh, what they do is they take liquid nitrogen, and there's different ways you can gasify uh, the commodity. You can uh, the steam generation. Literally, you're, you put it in steam. It looks like a little distiller coil. It, it heats up that liquid. It turns it into a gas, and that's how you distribute it out. And the second thing you do is you can use air exchangers, and air exchangers are literally what it sounds like, big cooling towers that are up there, and that actually heats up that liquid nitrogen and turns it into the gas. So they had a, a systems uh, robustness upgrade that they had planned all along that they've just completed and we've done a test to verify that it's working properly, where they've added these air exchangers in addition to the steam generators that we had before. And so this is a really a belts and suspender type of thing. If we have to switch from the steam generator to a air um, exchanger, they can do that. Uh, so we feel very comfortable that it's a, a robust capability. We, we require uh, commodities because it's such a big rocket. We require uh, a proportional amount of commodities. We do it to purge the cavities and make sure the ability locals are, are nice and dry and things like that. So there's a lot of different functionality on the vehicle that requires gaseous nitrogen. And uh, that's really, uh, that this added capacity of the air exchangers is a thing that really, and the ability to switch back and forth is really added some um, incredible uh, capacity and we're really happy to have it. In terms of the systems checkout, um, and off the top of my head, and I think Dr. Blevins will probably have to correct me on this, what we do is we literally spend a period of time where we're out at the pad and we basically create a situation where we're using up the commodity at the level that we would need it for wet dress rehearsal. We're not putting it on the vehicle. We're putting it on restrictor plates and other things so that we're actually pretending as if the vehicle is sitting at the pad consuming all this uh, the, the commodity that would be necessary to go through a wet dress rehearsal. And they do it for a long period of time. And, and that's how they verify that the system's ready to go, that all the pumps are up and running, the ability to switch around is there, and that we'll, we'll have a robust capability. Ability. Now I'm going to stop there. Uh, Dr. Blumens, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll add, uh, as you said, Tom, this is a service. It's critical to us, um, you know, particularly even after we tank the vehicle while we're evacuating the propellant. In this particular case or on the day of launch, if there's an aborted launch, it's particularly important because it prevents damage to our avionics by flowing the, the warm nitrogen into the system and preventing condensation. Uh, the way that we feel confident is that we asked for a long duration test and that was provided by this service provider. It was a 32 hour test. And every part of the profile of those 32 hours exceeded what we would do in, in both duration and in volume of nitrogen demand with simulated uh, resistance at the pad or dampers. Uh, and so that so we we basically have a witness now that that we can uh, get this commodity uh, to exceed the time duration and volume, but it is a very critical commodity, and and so that's of course why we roll back and and uh, it, and that one witness that uh, that company did is is what we've got to go with, and it, um, I'm I'm confident, but I'm also cautious because I need this commodity, or I've got to work real hard to exonerate hardware. Um, you know, if we if we can't provide the purge, so so uh, I'm ready to go uh, based on that one test. Yeah, and Cliff, I don't know if you want to add uh, anything to that. And uh, nothing to add, Tom. It, again, I, I'll just John. I would correct one thing. It was a 34 hour test. I think you had said 32. So just uh, clarify that. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with, um, you know, it was a very robust test. Of course, they use this commodity. They actually support every launch that takes place at the Cape. And so they're up and running. They're supporting ever launch activities. Ours is, uh, because it's a more capable rocket, uh, we have a proportional amount of use that we have for the rocket because of its size and scale. And I think they're ready to go. I agree with John, though. That we're, you know, we'll monitor the situation. And it's important to have gaseous nitrogen as with it is with every rocket. Um, that flies uh, because of the things that it provides the rocket. And this is not unique to us. It's really every rocket requires this type of perch capability. Uh, what's unique to us is that we have a rocket that's designed to go to the moon, and so it's a big rocket, and therefore we have a proportional need for a purge uh, relative to the size of the rocket. But I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable. I'm glad that they did the 34-hour test. I think that really does demonstrate robustness in the system, having visited the facility and physically seen the uh, changes and the additional cap capacity that they had planned on putting in, but we we we, we got it in, and and now we're ready to go. So I'm 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 very hopeful that that we will see good results when we do wet dress. Thank you. Our next question is from Manuel Manzanti of Debate. Hi, how are you, uh, Manuel Manzanti, covering the space program in Spanish? Actually, you I think you answered my question uh, before. Uh, actually, I was going to ask you if uh, the launch launch window that starts July 26 was out of the question, and obviously it is, we are moving to, to August. So yeah, you basically answered. Um, maybe something that is coming out of my mind right now, um, is CRS-25 being pushed to the ninth because the rollout now is the fifth? Yeah, I can't answer that question, Captain. Do you have that, or uh, that, that wouldn't? I wouldn't. Uh, that manual is a good question. I don't. I don't track the uh, that. Uh, we'd have to probably get back to it. Yeah, no, we were. Hey, Tom. This is Cliff. Um, I would just say we when we looked at setting the roll date, um, we were working around their dates. Um, they were originally scheduled, I believe, on the seventh, um, and I believe that change just occurred today. So I don't believe us rolling on the fifth, sixth, um, impacted that date. Yeah, and, I, and and generally speaking, we we want we want to roll so as as soon as we can. So yeah, I agree with uh, Cliff. No, that's a good way to say it, Cliff. Thank you. We have time for one final question, and that will be from Philip Sloss of NASA Space Flight. Thanks. Uh, thanks for taking another question. Um, I, I think this is actually sort of related to the uh, uh, gaseous nitrogen. Um, I think I think when you had some of the supply disruptions, you also have a converter compressor facility there. Um, I think we'd heard that there are some modifications or some upgrades that might that might be scheduled in the June timeframe. Are are is the CCF going to be ready to support a wet dress rehearsal around the 19th? Thanks. Yeah, Phil. Let me take. We'll, can we? We'll go offline and get you an answer. I want to make sure I get it exact. Hey. Right. Hey, go John, ahead. Um, yeah, I got information on that if you want me to go ahead. And yeah, 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 go ahead. I wasn't sure, so. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, they're expecting to uh, perform the repairs to a valve. Um, they're the redundant. There's a redundancy there, um, but the um, that's why we were able to complete the uh, air liquid testing. But um, the, the valve is expected to be repaired 6-1, um, no later than 6-3. And then uh, they'll do a retest and exercise that valve um, and the cycling of that valve from uh, zero to 100% open. And um, we don't expect that to take any longer than June 4th to be complete. All right, thank you very much. That, uh, thank you all for joining us today. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis dash one in about an hour. To follow along with the updates for the wet dress rehearsal test, please go to the Artemis blog at blogs.nasa.gov. Thank you again, and that will conclude our call.